Welcome to uh, the second iteration of Art Aperitif. Tonight I'm going to be talking about studio ceramics and the content for this program comes out of research that I've been doing on our collection of contemporary studio ceramics in preparation for a new installation that I'm working on. And this installation is going to focus specifically on different techniques that are used in decorating ceramics. So when I talk about studio ceramics, I'm talking about works that are unique, one-off pieces that are made by hand. Um, sometimes there can be two or more people uh, working on a single piece, but the key is that these are not mass-produced objects um, that were made on a large scale in a factory. They're typically coming out of uh, small-scale studios and usually one or a few people are controlling every step of the making process. So I just want to offer that distinction there. And second, why focus on techniques for decoration? One of the aspects of the decorative arts and specifically craft that I find so interesting is that artists are still creating objects using the same techniques that they've used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And despite advances in technology and equipment and science, sometimes the best way to do something is really the way that it's been done for hundreds of years. And I think there's something very special about contemporary work, no matter what material or form it is that honors those traditions of the past. So I'm going to share six different techniques for ceramic decoration that I've been researching and show one example from each in the museum's collection. So with that, I want to begin with the first uh, technique, which is uh, slip decoration. Slip has been utilized for thousands of years in cultures across the globe, and it's simply um, mixing clay with water so that the clay becomes a liquid. And slip has several different uses depending on its consistency. A thicker slip with a higher clay to water ratio can be used for what is known as slip casting. And this is where the liquid slip is poured into a mold to actually form an object. Um, the other uses with a thinner slip can be a glaze like um, consistency that can cover the whole clay body. And slip can also be used to decorate ceramics in a variety of ways. So I'm going to be talking about the latter two. And the first object that we have is a plate that was made by artist Randy Johnston. And this plate was made um, and decorated using three different kinds of slips. So let me get my pointer out. So the red background that you see here is actually a slip. It's not a glaze. And the white and black decoration are two different kinds of colored slips on the clay and there is no glaze on top of these slips. This is uh, Johnson's contemporary take on a process called slip trailing. This is um, when slip is put into a bottle or a dispenser that has a very fine point on it, and it's used to draw designs on the surface of the clay. So historically, this process was used to create highly intricate painterly designs, but Johnson's looks a little different. His tool of choice is actually a ladle, similarly to what you might use for your soup. Uh, he actually takes the slip in the ladle and pours it across the object to create designs that are similar to what we see here. And you can really see in this side view the thickness of the slip, specifically these areas here where you can see the white slip sort of very thick and sitting on top of the clay body. The next technique that I want to talk about is called scraffito. And this word comes from the Italian graffio, which means scratch. And graffio is actually where we get the word graffiti. The use of slip evolved into the art of scraffito decoration around the 10th century. And this technique really turns the clay into a canvas for drawing. 
It entails covering the clay body in a layer of colored slip and then cutting through that slip to expose the color of the clay body underneath. What appears to be a fairly simple process is actually quite requires quite a great deal of knowledge and dexterity because if the slip is too dry it will start flaking off and if it's too wet your lines will be smudged. So this is a bowl by the artist Matthew Metz and it shows this graffito decoration. Now I wish I could show you all sides of the bowl or um, a close-up of the bowl. Unfortunately, none of the graffito objects that I'm planning for this reinstallation have been photographed yet. So all I have is this reference photo, but I hope that you can see um, how he's using the graffito to create these um, these decorations here, and also how the scratch decoration provides this kind of texture on the background of the bowl. This section is all about clay in its unglazed, unslipped state. Whether it's stoneware, earthenware, or porcelain, clay has a texture to it that is, in essence, its own form of decoration. This is a work by the artist Rudolf Harry Staffel, and it's made of porcelain. In many of his works, Staffel uses the unglazed porcelain as both the form and the decoration of the object. And here he uses pieces of clay on the surface to create a texture and a design. And the blue color is a result of mixing powdered cobalt oxide into the porcelain, which creates this great contrast in color without using glaze. The title of the piece, Light Gatherer, is actually a name that Staffel used for all of his open vessels. They were created specifically to be lit from above and to pull the light into the vessel, which really activates the translucent nature of the porcelain and gives another dimension to the object. Now, we don't have a photograph of this particular object lit in that way, so I'm going to show you um, another photo of a different object so that you can get a sense of what this looks like and how the clay body is really being used with the light um, to create this effect. Moving from unglazed to glaze, a glaze is a mixture of various materials, including silica, which is the primary component in glass, minerals, oxides, and other additives for color and stability, which help the glaze adhere to the clay during firing. Historically, glazes served a practical purpose. They made the porous clay impermeable to water so that jugs, mugs, and bowls could really be utilized to their fullest. And today, glazes are a highly developed art. Ceramic artists have created signature glazes and techniques for applying them. But though they're very exacting and tested formulas, there's always a level of unpredictability when it comes to glazes. There are so many factors from how the glaze is applied to how it gets fired in the kiln that can affect the final appearance of the glaze. There are so many different types of glazes out there, but one of my favorites that I want to talk about um, now are crystalline glazes. And as the name suggests, there are crystals that form in the glaze during the firing process. And these glazes are really highly prized for their jewel-like appearance. It's believed that crystalline glazes were discovered accidentally in China during the Song Dynasty from 960 to 1279 AD. And this happened when a particular glaze called an oil spot glaze was found to have crystals in it after firing. And since that time, um, every, people have um, experimented with these glazes to really get the full effect of the crystals out of them. And the key to this technique is both the formula of the glaze as well as the process of firing it. So a steady temperature in the kiln for several hours before the piece cools really allows the crystals to bloom or form in the glaze. Of course, the end result is very difficult to control because as the glaze gets hot, it wants to melt down the side of the piece 
And it can, the crystals form in very unpredictable patterns, but I think that's one of the things that I really like about it. So this work is called Green Three Lobe Poison Bottle, and it was made by RISD alumna Rain Harris. And Harris's poison bottle series stemmed from her research into early women's cosmetics, which were made with what we know now as dangerous elements such as arsenic and lead. And so this cosmetic bottle kind of plays off this idea of something like a cosmetic that's, you know, meant to beautify a woman um, and it appears really beautiful and ostentatious, but at the same time, there's this dangerous uh, element to it. And I think the crystals and the glaze, um, which you can see all over the side here, um, kind of provide this, you know, beautiful but mysterious effect to the glaze that I really like. Now, one of the um, techniques that I'm really interested in, and there's so many different ways to talk about this, is texture. So not all artists are looking for a smooth, glossy finish to their ceramics. And what I love about a textured surface, especially in ceramics, is that it really invites exploration. Whether you're turning it over in your hands or exploring it visually, you really see the nuances of the glaze or slip interacting with the form of the clay underneath. This vase was made by Makoto Yabe. He's a ceramic artist who was born in Japan, but spent most of his life living and working in Boston. And again, here, we just have a reference photo, but I hope you can see the technique that's being used here. This face was used, um, was made using a technique called mentori. And this is a technique that is really about faceting or cutting and carving the surface of the clay. So as you can see here, um, it's not a smooth surface. You have these different faceted areas of the clay. And you can really see um, how the glaze and the slip are highlighting the peaks and valleys of the clay. The last um, technique that I wanna talk about is painting. Clay can be a fantastic canvas for painting. However, unlike traditional painting on a canvas, you still need to fire the ceramic in a kiln after it's painted, often multiple times, depending on how many colors you're using and the effect that you're trying to achieve. China paints or overglazed enamels, as they're referred to, are paints that are applied layer by layer on a ceramic that already has a base coating of glaze on it, which is called an underglaze and that has already been fired in the kiln. When the overglaze paints are fired, they melt into the glaze and really bond with it. So unlike the slip, which sits on top of the clay, the, um, the overglazed enamels really bond with the clay. And one of my favorite examples of painting on ceramics that I want to show here is this teapot by Kurt Weiser. And I'm showing you both sides of the same object. When Weiser first started making ceramics, his work was predominantly um, using sgraffito and black and white. But after a series of visits to Thailand, he was inspired by the region's intensely colored flora and fauna and sought to capture that visual richness in his work. And I think interestingly enough, um, the artist has recently gone back to working in black and white. And I would encourage you to check out some of those examples because they are equally as stunning as this one. As I mentioned earlier, there are technical challenges to the painting process. Because each work requires multiple firings, careful attention to detail and the order in which colors are applied to the clay really forces um, an artist to consider each piece before they start and think about how the painting is going to be executed. And here the scene on the teapot um, really kind of fades out of view and what you see is this three-dimensional painting that's floating in space, um, which is one of the things that I really like about this object. So I'm going to stop there and I would love to hear um, what objects uh, you are interested in, if any of these techniques 
um, you have more questions about or if anything specifically resonates with you. Thank you.